Well, good morning. The book of Romans is such a powerful book because it's, it's a book that makes you think. And one of the greatest minds ever, we get to see his thought process as he looks at human nature, the spirit of God, why we do the things that we do. In chapter six, we saw where he came through and showed us the power of sin is broken through Jesus Christ. But in chapter seven, Paul moves into the how do I do that? God's law revealing our sin, the struggle with sin, wanting to do what's right and doing what's wrong. Down in verse 18 in chapter seven, I know I'm rotten through and through is the conclusion that he comes to in his flesh. Verse 24, what a wretched man that I am. This is one of the holiest men to ever walk the face of the earth. That's why a Christian or a non-Christian that feels that they're righteous and holy in their own flesh is utterly ridiculous. But in verse 24, Paul moves from what do I do to who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin. I have sat through church services that have taught the book of Romans then gave us 10 things that we must be doing to be Christians. Just the opposite of what this book is saying. It's not the what to do. It goes back to a list. Us humans want a list, a list of things that tell us what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing, and it's exhausting. We need the who will help me, not the what will help me. The answer is the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit mentioned 19 times in this chapter. It's one of the best chapters in the Bible of helping us to understand who the Holy Spirit is in our lives, what he does in our lives, and how we can have victory in our lives. Last Sunday, I had to start with the first couple verses in chapter eight because it comes to the conclusion, the, the victory to all of this thought that he has. And so we'll go back to verse one in chapter eight. So now, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. I heard this illustration and I thought it was great. If you go to an airport and you see airplanes, they're sitting on the runway. They're not going anywhere because of the law of gravity. Otherwise, the law of gravity wasn't there. The airplane just goes straight up in the air. But as soon as their engines rev up, the law of aerodynamics takes over. Although gravity is still in effect pulling the planes down, there's a higher law, a more powerful force that's at work that allows them to overcome the law of gravity. And that's what Paul's saying. We're free by the spirit of Jesus Christ. He lives in us. He enables us to fly and overcome the law of sin and death. Verse three, the law of Moses was un unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. The law of Moses had over 613 laws. So God didn't want the law, so God did what the law could not do. He sent his only son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. His was without sin. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. The problem with the law is we just can't keep it. You can be determined and say, I'm gonna pray every morning for one hour. I'm gonna post it on my refrigerator. I'm gonna stick it to my bathroom mirror. But sooner or later, you're gonna find the weakness is not in those commitments at all, but it's in our own flesh. I don't know how many diets I've been on in my life. 
How many times I got it down? Went down to four sizes smaller in the clothes. Got rid of all of the large clothes because I was never going to eat like that again or gain weight again like that again. I had it down. Forget it. I'm going to die a skinny man. And what happened? Well, you deserve to have that strawberry shortcake. Everyone else is having it. Well, you deserve that. That's why Paul rejoices that God took care of the problem by sending his own son. So the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled, not by us, but by him in us. We are now free to obey the Holy Spirit that now guides us. And this is where we have to be understanding this totally. In our flesh, we will fail. There is a battle going on in each human being between the flesh and the spirit. The only way to have victory, the only way to please God is when we are in the spirit. Verse five, those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things. But those that are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that, pl that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Verse seven, for the sinful nature is always hostile towards God. Or in the original language, it has the thought, hates God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. This is Paul speaking through the power of the Holy Spirit. To live in the flesh simply means to give priority to the things of this world. Why is that death? Because man was created in the image of God. And since God is a trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, he created man in the lesser trinity, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit is the deepest part of us. The soul is our mind and emotions. And the body is the thing that we live in temporarily. When God created man, there was a beautiful connection between the spirit of man and the spirit of God. And as Adam and God walked together in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day, we saw that connection in Genesis 3.8. But when Adam gave in to his flesh, the material realm, he ate the forbidden fruit. He moved from a spiritual relationship with God to his flesh and soul and body. And this caused death to the spiritual connection to God. And you've seen me use this illustration, and I'm gonna use it a couple times in this message because I want to cement it in your head. But God is this perfect trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We were created in spirit, soul, and body. And this is how we connected to God, through the spirit. When Adam sinned, something died. And what died was the connection. And human beings flipped upside down. And now Father, Son, and Holy Spirit does not connect to the body, the flesh, like it was originally designed. When Jesus died on the cross and we asked him to be our Lord and Savior, it flipped things back to normal. And we now have the connection with God through the spirit the way we were originally designed. And because of that, we have the power and the strength to do what's right. Verse eight, that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Without that connection, without it being the way it's supposed to be, we are dead to God. There's no connection. They might be nice people. They might be nicer than most Christians that you know. That still does not connect them to God. It still does not save them. It still does not give them the hope or the power to live a Christian life. Verse eight, that's why those that are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Not Pastor Dave's words, the word of God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. And I showed you how that works. In King James, it says, and I love this, the spirit of God dwells in you. He's inside of you. It means to be at home in you. So the question 
we all need to ask, is the Spirit of God at home in us? If we're a believer, he's in you without question, but is he at home in your life? Or do you take him places, conversations, and involve yourself in things that are not of him? Do we drag the Holy Spirit into those circumstances and places? Goes on to say, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. I think about Solomon in the Old Testament. He had everything. He had all the power he could ever want, all the money he could ever spend. 1,000 of the most beautiful women on the face of the earth at his beck and call. Endless parties, education, philosophy. He had everything this material world had to offer. But here's the dilemma. Nothing satisfied him. Nothing. You know, the average person thinks, I'm almost happy. If I can just have that bigger home, that newer car, if I could just pay this off, if I just had more money and savings, there will never be enough. I can't tell you how many people I've experienced in my life that thought if they could get to this point or that point in life, then they would be comfortable, then they would be content, then all their problems would be taken care of. And I've never found it to be true. Solomon was stuck. He's at the top. There's no bigger car or horse and buggy. After a thousand of the most beautiful women in the world, why would a thousand one be important? He can't contain the amount of money and palaces and everything that he has. And yet we see in his life story that he's never been more empty. There's a hole in every human being that only one thing can fill, and that's God. No material thing can. And yet, it's so easy to live for materialism. I know earlier in life, I always felt like if I just had more, if I just had newer, if I just had bigger. It's interesting in life now, I'm thinking if I could just get smaller, if I could just have less, if I didn't have to heat and air condition that much square footage, if I didn't have to polish and clean and repair all this stuff, things come back into perspective because it doesn't matter how much you have, how much you get, if that's what you were using to bring you contentment, when you get it, you don't have to contentment. You normally just have to work your hiney off to keep it from breaking. We live in a world that's just falling apart. The maintenance that's involved to take care of the things that we have is overwhelming. Now here we have Paul that comes along and he's given up everything to serve God. Everything. And it's really simple. To live for the world is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, Solomon did figure it out. After about 12 years of money, women, power, philosophy, he said in Ecclesiastes at 12.13, here now is my final conclusion. After all of it, fear God and obey his commands for this is everyone's duty. And from that time on, when Solomon came to that point, he lived a godly life. You saw it. If you were asked, what's been controlling your soul? Has it been your flesh? Or has it been God's spirit? If you're gonna live for the material and live for your flesh, you're never going to have contentment. You're never going to have peace. You're never going to have that still, quiet peace that comes from being close to the Lord. If you live by the Spirit, you'll know life and peace that comes from being eternally minded. Everything has balance when we're internally minded. When we weigh our decisions out, when we weigh the way we react, when the way that we talk and the way that we think, it comes with a piece that you don't get any other way. And it takes so many years for some of us very dense to figure this out. You can see it in others. Verse 10. 
And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you the life because you have made, you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. Our sinful nature tells us, go ahead, everyone else is doing it. This will bring you pleasure. You deserve it. When you ever hear yourself saying you deserve something, take a check real quick, because if any one of us, including me, got what I deserve from God, this would be a big poof in the room. You know, we don't want pain. We don't want suffering. We don't want difficulty. It's not fun. It's not easy. Anyone that stands here and says it's great to suffer for God, they're pretty much a liar. It's great if you're suffering and you can bring God glory, but it's never great to suffer. But if we put in perspective what we deserved, our worst day of suffering isn't even close. Verse 13. If you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put it to death, it means mortify it, the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. The reason we are to put to death our sinful nature is that if we give it mercy, it'll end up putting us to death. The old saying, give it an inch, it'll take a mile. Give it an inch, inch, it'll take 20 miles. Verse 14, for all who have led by the Spirit of God are children of God. This is why Romans 8 is so wonderful. Too many believers are trying to fix bad, evil habits and tendencies on their own, and they're exhausted. I love this. When asked how to find the will of God, St. Augustine simply said, it's really simple. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, and then you can do whatever you want. Now, how can he say this? If you love the Lord with all your mind, heart, and soul, you won't do him wrong. Loving him that way means that you will do right because that's what love is. If you love somebody, you're not going to harm them. If you truly love somebody, love is a word. We love hamburgers and pizza and ice cream. Love is a flippant word for the English language. But the agape love is the unconditional love, willing to die for someone, esteeming someone above yourself. If you agape love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, how are you going to do him wrong? You will die to your sinful nature. And you will walk in your spirit if you love the Lord. So many people claim to be Christians and claim to love the Lord. And I look at the lifestyles and I go, that doesn't line up. Either you're ignorant to the word of God or you don't truly love him. If we love the Lord, I love Psalm 37. Says that the spirit will change the desires of our heart to conform to his will. You know, if you truly love the Lord, you will not be able to be comfortable in sin. If you are comfortable in flat-out transgression in your life, you are not loving the Lord. It's as simple as that. The psalmist here in, in um, Psalm 37 looks at the ungodly, sees how they're being blessed at some times, they're getting advantages, they're getting richer. They're making more money. They're not paying their taxes. They're lying about this. They're lying about that. They're buying new cars. They're having big mansions. And he looks at that, and he comes to the conclusion when he studies it, and he chooses to live in the spirit and not in the flesh. I'm going to read it to you because you watch him looking at the world and what it does. Psalm 37. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong, for like grass they will soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they will soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. 
Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. He will make your innocent radiate like the dawn, and justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about the wicked schemes. Don't be angry. Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For the wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will, po- will possess the land. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosper. The wicked plot against the godly and they snare at them in defiance. But the Lord just laughs, for he sees their day of judgment coming. The wicked draw their swords and string their bows to kill the poor and the oppressed, to slaughter those who do right. But their swords will stab their own hearts and their bows will be broken. It's better to be godly and have little than to be evil and be rich. For the strength of the wicked will be shattered, but the Lord takes care of the godly. Day by day the Lord takes care of the innocent, and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever, forever, eternity. They will not be disgraced in hard times, even in famine they will have more than enough. But the wicked will die. The Lord's enemies are like flowers in a field, they will disappear like smoke. The wicked borrow and never pay, repay, but the godly are generous givers. Those the Lord blesses will possess the land, but those he curses will die. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their life. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Once I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. The godly always give generous loans to others, and their children are a blessing. Turn from evil and do good, and you will live in the land forever. For the Lord loves justice, and he will never abandon the godly. He will keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and will live there forever. The godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. They have made God's law their own, so they will never slip from his path. The wicked wait in ambush for the godly, looking for an excuse to kill them. But the Lord will not let the wicked succeed or let the godly be condemned when they are put on trial. Put your hope in the Lord, not the wicked's, and let the godly be, oh, what did they get? Put, but the Lord will not let the wicked succeed or let the godly be condemned when they are put on trial. Put your hope in the Lord. Travel steadily along his path. He will honor you by giving you the land. You will see the wicked destroyed. I have seen the wicked and the ruthless people flourishing like a tree in its native soil. But when I looked again, they were gone. Though I searched for them, I could not find them. Look at those who are honest and good, for a wonderful future awaits those who love peace. But the rebellious will be destroyed. They will have no future. The Lord rescues the godly. He is their fortress in times of trouble. The Lord helps them, rescuing them from the wicked. He saves them and they find shelter in him. The psalmist lets the spirit of God change the desires of his heart to conform to God's will. Everything came into perspective as he looked at the world. Verse 15, so you you have not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. The word Abba in Aramaic means Papa. And I grew up with a grandpa that every kid should have had for a grandpa. He was Papa Nick. And Grandma and Papa, they came and got me every time Mom and Dad turned their heads. They would drive from Oakland where they lived and they would just show up and, and grab my stuff. My mom would go, where are you going? She goes, I'm taking them. He taught me how to use tools. He taught me how to work. The man just loved me. You know, everybody should have the opportunity to be loved like that. And I remember just what a sweet thing it was to get to call him Papa, how tender it was. And I loved that when my grandkids 
were old enough to talk, they chose Papa for me. And I just, I see it such a tender, loving person in my mind because of what I experienced. And so when I think of the Lord being Papa, Abba, Father, I think how sweet is that? How tender is that? Verse 16, for a spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children See, when his spirit was rejoined, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and we were upside down, when we got right side up, we were rejoined with God's spirit. Christians have the power of God, his Holy Spirit, living inside of them. We should be better than we are. We still choose to listen to the spirit or the flesh in our lives. But total contentment, total peace, and what pleases God is when we listen to the spirit of God in our lives. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we also must share his suffering. He didn't promise us that we wouldn't suffer. He didn't promise us mansions and millions and easy lives. Um, He promised us eternity with him. He promised us a body that would never fail again. If you would um, be faithful with me for just take a minute, Kristen is seeing a doctor right now to help her with this excruciating pain from the cancer. And um, inside, it's beginning to uh, fill with fluids and um, you know, beautiful saint that has blessed this church that I keep pleading with God to heal her so that we selfishly want to keep her with us. Um, It's one thing to go and be with the Lord, it's another to suffer in pain. So just take a second, and um, if you just pray with me at this moment, Lord. We pray that the doctors have a pain management that helps her not to be in that kind of pain. And Lord, we pray for a miraculous healing, a touch of your hand could fix her in a moment. And Lord, she has brought such honor and glory and faithfulness to you through all of this suffering. But I pray for Kristen right now, Lord, for a miracle. One way or another, Lord, we know your will is perfect, but from this side of heaven, we love our sister and we don't want her suffering, Lord. Pray for you to be with the family as they go through this, to give Rob strength and to help them, Lord. Pray for the wisdom of the doctors that they're seeing right now. And we ask it in Jesus' name. To be an heir of God is to be a child of God. When um, I met Valerie, she had a four-year-old little girl. Her husband was killed in a car accident. And uh, Valerie came into our, our gym that we had to start working out. And after a couple times coming in, she shows up with this little brown eye, brown hair, olive skin girl. Cutest thing I've ever seen. And so when Valerie was working out, I would sit down and talk with her. And she was four years old and she talked like a teenager. She was as tall as a teenager at four years old. And I just fell in love with this little girl. So I asked Valerie out. And... um, we went on a date, and after we got done with the date, I said, can we, can we take your little girl to dinner? And I knew after that dinner that I was gonna raise that little girl. And, uh, and then we had Sabrina. And April 
was adopted into my life and she has all that I have. There's no difference between my girls. All that I have, all my good and all my bad, all our difficult and all our victories. I could not love her any less. It's not possible. And when I think that you and me as Christians, we got that deal. All of God. Stuff that we don't understand, stuff that seems difficult, stuff that seems miraculous, things that have happened that there's no excuse for other than he did it, things that we prayed for that he didn't do, that we don't understand. But all of God became ours, like all of what I had became April's. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. It's, it, it, if you wrap your, your, yourself around that at all, it's amazing. And the love that we should have for him because he took our sturdy, rotten, no good for nothing human beings and he made a way for us to be holy, separate, set apart. Why would I choose the flesh? Why would I give him anything but the spirit that he put inside of me? We that have trusted Christ are children of the living God. When was the last time that you took some time and thought about that? When was the last time that you just dwelt upon that? And if that was on our mind daily, how much easier would it be to battle this flesh that we live in? He deserves our very best. And not only does he deserve it, he put himself inside of us to empower us to do that. There is no new good thing in any of you or me apart from God. The minute we start to think that we're something in ourselves, we're messed up beyond messed up. It's God's spirit in us. As the worship team comes up, Paul has done the most brilliant job of helping us to understand who we are in Christ Jesus. I've watched people mess this up, turn it into legalism in spite of what they've just read. I've watched people just do such nonsense many times because they don't teach the whole word. They take little pieces out of this and then give a sermon on the do's and don'ts of being a Christian. Apart from him, we can do nothing. We can do no good. And coming to that conclusion is a gigantic victory in our lives. The power of the Holy Spirit is what allows you and me to do what's right no matter how we feel. I get in trouble at times for feelings. I get, oh, you're all, you know, you don't pay attention to feelings and you don't listen to feelings. And, I, and what I try to explain and to myself and others is that you can't trust your feelings. Your feelings are all over the place, bent and moved by life situations and family situations and the way you grew up and, and, and in the things that you have. I have some friends that I just love, uh, men, that, that their childhood was insanity. Could not even at the pulpit tell you what they went through, what they experienced, and the atrocities of being raised without family that loved them. And the consequences and the decisions and the things that they made because of that. And when they look at life, life is very difficult for them because their feelings are based on those horrible things that have happened to them in their lives. But when we became Christians, 
something far greater than anything that's horrible happened in our life is that we became adopted into the creator of heaven and earth. And we have the ability to have victory over those things. And all three friends, when they call me and they're in turmoil, and I can see them just stuck and banging, caught, just hitting a brick wall with the thoughts and the feelings, I let them talk. They need to, they need to share. And then I take them back to who they are as a child of God. And, and for all of us, we all deal with some difficulties, some more than others. But if our feelings are not based on what's doing what's right, and that's forgiving others because we've been forgiven for so much, that's for not being bitter, that's for not retaliating those are all the things that we give back to the Lord. And we do what's right because it's pleasing to him and we're empowered to do it because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. It's a great message. It's one that I could hear over and over again because by tomorrow morning, life's gonna be at me in about 10 different directions and I gotta remember it all over again. I gotta remember it all over again. Would you stand with me? Church, I, one of the reasons we don't up here pray for everybody um, is a lot of times people do things that they don't understand that they shouldn't do. Um, they don't need anyone to call and give them an answer to healing cancer or a method for it. They've done research enough. They don't need anyone to call them and tell them about if they had enough faith they could be healed, they don't need, they really don't, you need to respect privacy. Um, if you ever just wanted to send flowers and say I love you and thinking of you, that's beautiful. Don't try to have the answers for answers that we don't have. And that's something that we can all learn. I've, I've, I had, I've made that mistake a lot of times and learned as a pastor sometimes I just need to cry with people and, and be still. Um, she knows that God is good. She's proven that. She doesn't need to tell us to tell her that. She doesn't need us to tell her you can get through anything, you know, if you're a Christian. She doesn't need those kinds of things. So I want, as a church, use wisdom. Um, don't everybody run to the phone call and call their house or say I heard something at church. Just, just be smart. I want, she's so important to this body, I wanted this body to be praying for her. Um, but I, I want us to all use wisdom in that. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May your week with him be sweet and tender, intimate as a child of God. Don't let our feet touch the ground when we wake up in the morning until we've asked you to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, to have all of you working in us, Lord, to help us give you back what you so deserve, and that's our all. And we thank you, Lord, for living in us and providing the power to do that. Help us, Lord, to keep these things in our minds to weigh against all of life's circumstances, we pray. And the church said, God bless you.